Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth episode of Avas, connected by the Economics, Politics and Social Sciences Interest Group of IIM Koyikod. Today, we'll be discussing agricultural economics and also how contract farming as a concept has evolved over the years in our country. To discuss the same, we have with us Dr. Stanu Nair. Dr. Stanu Nair is an associate professor in the field of economics at IIM Koyikod. He has done his PhD from the Madras School of Economics. His research interests include public policy, public finance and agricultural policy. He has done various consultation projects in association with the Niti Aayog, with the Ministry of Commerce and Industry and also the Department of Commerce. His research findings have been used in various articles that have been published in the Economic Times, in the Live Mint and also the BBC.com. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik and EPS uh, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, it's really good to be here I mean, to discuss some of the uh, contemporary issues facing Indian agriculture. So, according to the estimates of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, every year around $14 billion worth of our farm output is wasted. On the other hand, around 194 million people in India go hungry every day. So why do we see this basic mismatch of supply and demand not being met in spite of the reason that our farm output is higher than what we need to feed our people? So you are right. Uh, today, actually, India produces uh, enough food to feed its population. Uh, if you look back and uh, look at our uh, history, immediately after independence, that means in the initial few decades after independence, uh, we actually faced continuous food shortage. And in fact, we were depending on food aid from uh, developed nations. And even if we had food riots, uh, that, that means people are fighting for food. But uh, thankfully, after the introduction of Green Revolution, the food situation in India has improved very slowly. And uh, due to that, today we are in a very, very strong position as far as food production is concerned. To give us a couple of examples, today we are the largest producer of rice, wheat, fruits and vegetables in the world after China. And we are the world's top producer of pulses and milk. And uh, India is the sixth largest exporter of agricultural products after European Union, USA, Brazil, China and Canada. But this uh, situation of excess or uh, I mean good production has given rise to two important problems. One is storage and the other is distribution. Let me first talk about storage. I mean, let me give an, an example. Uh, people have estimated that nearly 30% of the horticultural output in India is lost because of uh, wastage of food. And even government's own uh, estimation, that is the estimation by Ministry of Consumer Affairs, shows that in the last five years, nearly 57,000 tons of food grains stored in Food Corporation of India godowns have got damaged and became un useless for human consumption. This is mainly due to inadequate storage infrastructure or capacity inadequate cold storage facilities and absence of quick connectivity between farmers and consumers. So what is the solution to this uh, problem? Uh, basically we have to focus on four important reforms. One is we need to augment the storage capacity because the storage capacity in India is not enough uh, to store I mean, the food which we are producing. And not only that, we have to make use of advanced storage technique like uh, temperature controlled cold chain logistics. And most importantly, I mean, we need to link farmers directly with markets, including agribusiness firms, for faster movement of uh, food products from the farm field to the markets and warehouses. And finally, I mean, we need to actually uh, reform the government-controlled agricultural markets. We call it as popular, um, popularly as uh, mandis. And why? Because they basically lack I mean, infrastructure facilities, including storage and cold storage facilities. But here I need to I mean, emphasize one important point and off late uh, because of the intervention by the private corporate sector into the food business, especially in the organized retailing. The uh, storage uh, infrastructure and techniques have been improving. I'm talking about the private corporate sector. And they are able to manage uh, the food which they, um, they uh, buy from the farmers in a much more better way than the public sector, which means that the issue remains serious in public sector even today. For instance, the manner in which rice and wheat are stored in government warehouses leaves a law to be decided. Uh, apart from covered godowns, they basically store food grains in what is called a cover and plinth system, that is method, where they actually store food grains in open yards covered with uh, some waterproofing material. 
So this is not a very scientific way of uh, storing food drains because if you do like this, definitely I mean the wastage will be very high. And in addition to that, there are problems like pest attack, leakages in go-downs, I'm talking about government go-downs, then there is also exposure to rain and floods. But having said that, I should also say that uh, the governments have been uh, making effort from time to time to, to improve the uh, storage facility. Uh, to give an example, in the last few years, the government has invested substantial amount of money uh, for building storage capacity, I mean, especially for food drains. Uh, to give you a statistics, uh, uh, recently, I mean, the government has approved a plan to construct steel silos for uh, uh, storing the food drains and the capacity they are talking about is around 100 lakh metric tons. So this they are, I mean, planning to uh, finish it by 2020. Similarly, the government has, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, built 23 lakh metric tons of covered warehouses and 6.2 lakh metric tons of silos. And coming to the important point of food distribution, the most affected people here are the poorest of the poor and the vulnerable sections of the society. And the only way we can help them out uh, is to strengthen the public distribution system or similar forms of food distribution channels financed and managed by the government. But the current PDS system, though I mean it is uh, helping a lot of people to access food, but it suffers from a lot of problems and let me highlight only a few problems. One is, I mean we have the problem of exclusion error, I mean as per uh, that, we actually identify the beneficiaries inaccurately. Then we also have I mean, leakage and diversion of food drains during transportation, that means when the food gets transported from uh, the godowns of food corruption in India, to the uh, ration shops. In between, a lot of food gets diverted and this is a very important issue in India. And we also have the problem of inclusion error where large number of bogus cards, cards or ghost cards are getting generated. Uh, we need to reform the PDS system and already I think the government has initiated a lot of reforms to reform the PDS system. And most importantly, the government has started distributing other linked digitized ration cards so that we can eliminate the bogus uh, beneficiaries and the government also has initiated computerization of, computerization of fair price shops and uh, the governments are using GPS technology to track the movement of trucks and uh, finally the government is allowing the citizens to monitor the PDS commodities through SMS alerts which means that the people can be vigilant in case the food gets di diverted and uh, that, um, that's because they get SMS alert as soon as the food reaches their village. And the point is that if this kind of reforms are implemented effectively, uh, I think uh, it will definitely solve the problem of supply demand mismatch when it comes to meeting the food requirements of poor and vulnerable sections of India. Sir, of all the issues that farmers currently face, unavailability of markets is one big problem. Why is it so difficult to cater to the needs of the farmers in spite of the existing mandis and other government facilities? Okay. So in India, uh, the interstate trading, that means the trade that happens within the states of agricultural produce falls under the domain of the state governments. And uh, such trading has been governed by an act called Agricultural Produce Marketing Committee Act and which are again the in the domain of the states. And as per this APMC Act, uh, there is a committee called Agricultural Produce Marketing Committee which oversees the functioning of government regulated agricultural markets which are popularly known as Mandis. And within a Mandi, the sale of agricultural produce occurs mainly through auction and this auction is intermediated by the uh, middlemen or intermediaries which are called traders and commission agents. The main problem is that in this system, the farmers face some of the problems. First of all, uh, there is no transparency in pricing in this kind of markets, which means that farmers doesn't know the real price of uh, the produce and uh, accordingly, the traders and commission agents can actually manipulate the prices. And then uh, they actually export the farmers through improper grading and weighing of the produce. And most importantly, farmers do not realize the full price of what the consumers Pay. That means there is only a fraction of the final price which we pay as consumers. So this is the fundamental issue which the farmers face because of the existing agricultural market which is managed by the government. So was there any effort done by the government to improve the situation? Yes. Uh, for example, in the year 2003, the central government drafted a model APMC legislation. That means it actually uh, circulated a model APMC legislation 
to the states for their implementation. That means it slightly, I mean, modified the uh, traditional APMC Act. Basically, it has provided a provision for the farmers to sell their farm produce directly to the buyers. And the buyers could involve, I mean, involve the organized retailers or agribusiness firm or even exporters. And this the government has allowed the farmers to do by bypassing the mandis, which means that, I mean, without going through the uh, APMC managed market, they can straight away sell the produce to the buyers. Uh, but the main problem is that this arrangement didn't succeed uh, because the buyers have to register with the APMCs, that is Agricultural Produce Marketing Committees. But then the main problem is that the APMCs, the committee, lacked incentive to promote direct buyers because at the end of the day, it threatened the business of traders and commission agents in the Mondays, which means that if you allow I mean, new players to come in and uh, uh, allow the farmers to directly engage with them, then uh, they felt that the traders and commission agents would I mean, lose business. So uh, what is the way out I mean, to avoid this kind of complication? The best uh, way to overcome this kind of uh, problem is that you provide direct selling or marketing options to the farmers outside the APMC setup, which means that you completely delink direct selling from the APC, APMC setup. And how can you do that? You promote contract farming and connect the farmers directly with the organized retailers and exporters outside the APMC framework. And uh, then you can also promote models like Apni Mandis in Punjab, Raitu Basas in Andhra Pradesh and whatever Sundays in Tamil Nadu where the farmers are directly, I mean, uh, will directly come to a market which is managed by the government and sell their produce direct to the consumers rather than through the intermediaries. And I think only through such workable direct marketing initiatives, we can ensure a prior, fair price to the farmers. So from your classes, I remember that contract farming as an option has come up time and again as a possible solution for solving agriculture market issues. So, and also government has recently come up with a model contract farming act. So do you think that we needed a standalone act on top of the existing APMC and ICA act? And what are the other benefits of the new model contract farming act? So basically this contract farming practice involves linking farmers with a known buyer and that buyer could be an agribusiness firm or an exporter or a retail chain. Which means that you link the farmers with a known buyer through a forward contract in which the farmer promises to the to the buyer to supply a certain quantity of an agricultural product within a pre-agreed time frame subject to certain conditions. Which means that it's simply a contract between a farmer and a buyer and in which the farmer promises the buyer that I mean he or she will supply certain product at a given time at a given price. And uh, to facilitate that, the firms can supply uh, the farmers all kinds of inputs and it, it can give all types of supports to the farmers. When I say firm, I mean the buyers. Uh, but the point is that due to the poor response to the direct selling provisions contained in the model APMC Act 2003, the government in fact in the year 2017 uh, has come, come out with another model APMC Act for governing the Mondays. So what it has done in this new Act, APMC Act, it basically left out all the provisions relating to the direct selling under the purview of the Act, in the, I mean this new Act. So thereby it paved the way for drafting a separate model Act on the subject of contract farming. And accordingly, in May 2018, the central government released a model contract farming and services Act. And uh, this Act has provided, I mean, a uh, very nice legal and regulatory framework for protecting and promoting the interest of both farmers and the firms under the contract farming system. And now uh, it is up to the state governments to decide whether they want to adopt this model act or not because uh, agriculture in India is a state subject. And uh, But the main point is that this act addresses many concerns related to the adoption of contract farming system in India. Let me give few examples. First of all, the act uh, suggested that, I mean, uh, the states need to uh, set up an official agency, I mean a board for guiding the contract farming system. Why? Because currently we don't have a specific mechanism or official body to take care of this contract farming system. Second, this act has, I mean, uh, provisions to provide crop insurance to the farmers. I mean, that means some kind of compulsory crop insurance. And it also has provisions for fixing the qualities 
quality of the produce produced by the farmers many times a lot of dispute occurs between the farmers and the firms in assessing the quality of the produce and the act has also given a lot of mechanisms to prevent exploitation of the farmers for example it has given the farmers equal power to fix prices and it has also mandated that the electronic machines should be used for weighing the products and the act has also uh, provisions to prevent payment delay because many times the firms delay the payment to the farmers and to overcome that the act has suggested that the firms have to pay with interest in case they delay the payment and most importantly the act has provisions to avoid contract break which means that I mean, if at all any party breaks away from the contract at any time they have to pay a penalty and in addition to all these things the act has a provision to i mean uh, allow the uh, players to exit from the contract because uh, uh when you want to i mean break away from the contract exit from the contract you need to have a provision so the act says that with the mutual agreement and with the approval of the board they can do that and finally and most importantly the act has elaborate provision to resolve any dispute that happens between the firms and the farmers there are critics uh, who say that this uh, model is not required because what they say is that we need uh, not uh, require a separate law for governing contract farming why because they say that already there is an act called indian contract act 1872 it's a very old act to govern all the general contractual relationship uh, especially in the business and uh, they also say that i mean already the model act i mean adopted by the government in 2003 has a direct selling provision to entertain contract farming but my point is that i mean a stand alone law to govern contract farming is needed in india at this juncture why because if you look at ica that is i mean uh, indian contract act it cannot take adequately i mean the interest of both the farmers and the uh, firms because it doesn't take care of the disparity in power equation between the parties uh, why because in the case of farmers and uh, firms the farmers are weaker uh, sections and the firms are stronger which means that there is actually there is no disparity between them which means that you need to take care of that i mean when you do, i mean enact an act but ICA doesn't take care of that and uh, in ICA i mean uh, oral contractual agreements are allowed but the point is that in case of agriculture if you allow oral contractual agreements it doesn't i mean uh, uh, work out very well because uh, the parties can uh, um, break away from the contract at any time and also if you enter into oral agreement you cannot clearly explain the terms and conditions and so that tomorrow i mean uh, we, the parties um, doesn't uh, break away from the contract and uh, most importantly uh, the ica is a general business uh, uh, law which means it governs the uh, contract which are entered into the, in, in 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 different business segments but this model act is a detailed legislation tailor made for the specific requirements of agriculture so how do contract farming practices vary across the globe can you highlight certain models that were successful in other countries and what might be certain challenges in india implementing these models This contract farming model is not a very new model which you are talking about today. We say it is a very tried and tested model which is practiced across the world for promoting agricultural growth and rural economic growth. And this model has worked pretty well in many countries. I mean, there are many countries where this model has done very well. And to name a few, uh, China, Brazil, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Ghana, and uh, Madagascar, Mozambique, Brazil, Argentina. So I can add on several countries. I mean. to uh, show that this model has worked pretty well and uh, if you survey the models available across the globe there are three common forms of contract farming emerges and the first model is a very simple arrangement where the firm promises to supply all inputs and extension services directly to the farmer and then the firm deducts the cost from the final price which it pays to the farmer and the second model is uh, slightly i mean dif- different and in this case the firm supplies all inputs and extension services to the farmers indirectly through a third party or an independent input supplier and then deducts the cost from the final price and the model 3 it is slightly different in this case the independent suppliers after supplying the inputs to the farmers they get paid by the banks from which the firms have taken loan and at the end of the day I mean, after the harvest the firm repays its loan to the bank by deducting the costs from the final price to be paid by the farmer the point is that it is up to the each country 
to tweak this model as per their local socio-economic environment. It's very difficult to suggest. I mean, a, a fixed model to I mean to uh, promote or uh, to work out this Carter farming model. This model has several adverse consequences, and we need to mitigate those challenges. For example, many times, as I said earlier, the firms may delay the payments to the farmers, which is an adverse consequences. So we need to have a system to uh, avoid this kind of problems. Sometimes the farmers may break away from the contract because they get a better price outside the contract. I mean, the price agreed in the contract. So this kind of problems emerge, and which means that we need to tackle uh, such challenges. Uh, looking from this angle, I think the recent decision of the central government to formulate the model act is a step in the right direction. But the main point is that it is the prerogative of the state governments to enact a law using this model which is available before them and adopt the same to improve the welfare of the farmers. And uh, when I say that, what I mean to say is that the central government cannot do much on this and it is now up to the states to uh, try it out at least on pilot basis and see whether this model can be improved, uh, it can improve the welfare of the farmers. So this was the first part of our fourth episode. Please stay tuned for the second episode. Thank you.